Welcome to Cloud Identity and Access Management is the New Perimeter. Learn how to govern it or lose control. I'm Christopher Hertz, Vice President of Cloud Security Sales with Divi Cloud by Rapid7. And I'm joined by James Martin, who's Technical Product Manager for Divi Cloud by Rapid7. A quick bit on, on me, a little background real quick. I've been in tech for 20 years, uh, spent a long time in operations, um, and now uh, work on the more the commercial side of things. But um, spent you know the last decade really helping customers transform through the secure adoption of cloud. Um, and uh, James, why don't you say hello and, and let's uh, hear a little bit about a uh, quick background on you. Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, James Martin, um, I am the technical product manager for the identity and access management product that we'll be talking about here at Divi, at Divi Cloud by Rapid7. Um, I've been in the cloud space since about 2010 um, on, on the engineering. Um, and the administration side also have led um, a uh, enterprise adoption of DevOps uh, tools and practices uh, in my in my previous uh, past. I'm very excited here to talk about uh, what we're doing with IAM. Thanks for joining, James. Well, let me let me set the table first and just talk about what a lot of the folks we talk to are struggling with, which is that technology innovation is accelerating. Time of that, uh, the sort of the, the, the technology itself is being, you know, the technology itself, the adoption of it's accelerating. The time in which that adoption is occurring is also accelerating. It's being, it's being shrunk. Um, and then, as we all know right now, there's just an enormous amount of chaos in the world, you know, driven by things like the pandemic. And so there's all this unplanned digital workforce disruption. And as a result, risk has moved from being two dimensional to really three dimensional. Um, and much of that risk is around adoption of cloud because that's what's being accelerated, right? Innovation itself is driven by the agility of cloud. Um, we're being we're adopting cloud more and more quickly for all sorts of reasons. And the cloud services themselves, when we think about Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Alibaba Cloud, all of those things are constantly shifting, and the people who are using them are constantly shifting, and they're all ephemeral. And um, and this creates this three dimensional risk um, that for many organizations is simply unmanaged. Um, and at the root of all of that, we find identity and access management. Uh, and I wanted to turn to James and say, why is that? Why is identity and access management called the new perimeter in the world of cloud? Can you shed some light based on, on your background and experience? Yeah, sure. If, if you look at, you know, historically, there, there's always been a problem of, of the, the bad folks on the outside trying to get into your network, trying to steal your data, trying to you know, impersonate a user, uh, what have you, and and you know, for, for a long time, it, there people have been creating tools and process around protecting that perimeter, protecting uh, the bad things um, from getting into your network. Um, but what what we found with um, you know, with talking to our customers um, and this new great adoption and migration to the cloud is that while you know that that space is is pretty mature. And those processes are, are fairly well um, um, have been uh, locked down, and, and uh, they haven't yet really taken a good look at what's going on on the inside. And with cloud, you know, there is so there's so much um, uh, it's so open ended on the inside, and un really understanding what uh, can happen in the in, in the relationships between the the principles and the resources on the inside is really hard to to grasp. Um, and so yeah. Um, yeah, and I like that. I, I think that the other thing we hear is that it's it's a porous perimeter, right? In the sense, that there is there is often no inside and no outside in the cloud, and in part that's driven by all the self service access, right? You have all these. We we look at companies all the time where there's dozens, if not hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of people who are configuring and provisioning in public cloud across yep. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, and others. And the yep. challenge that we, I often observe, you tell me if I'm right or wrong here, is that you don't have a hardened perimeter that's sort of centrally controlled, right? That instead what you have is lots of different cloud services, all of whom have their own access, right? And their own identities. And this creates a really complicated mesh. And, and let's talk about that. Yeah. You know, I guess what that leads to is it becomes really important in this world that like actually how things are accessed and, and whether they're controlled appropriately is more and more about the identity and access management. And it's more about understanding what people what what things i should say people right because everything has identity right is that is that yeah. accurate yeah we're, we're talking about machines and and people here yep, yeah sure. so, so so it's not just people and i think that's what we mean by principle right it's it's, it's yep. whatever has that identity 
what right. can that identity do and what does that have access to and that and that mesh and can you talk about the complication there I mean, what's what what does that look like in, in your in your mind yeah so if, if you are you know if you're a, a large a large enterprise or any any you know sort of uh, company that has a significantly complex uh, uh, cloud adoption um, the the number of principles the number of machines or people um, and uh, it, it, you know, if if that is a a large, hard to quantify number, um, all you should also be looking at the number of resources because uh, it's just like the the number of resources and the number of principles can hugely complicate the the questions around access, right? So yeah. if you have this sea of resources, cloud resources, S3 buckets, SNS topics, RDS instances, and then you have all these developers and and security folks and they have the 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 identities that the machines themselves are using um it's really hard to make the connection uh and and, and understand uh what it can access what uh, there's yeah. nothing that's drawing the lines um between that access right that it all all it's all defined in a essentially a, a machine interpreted language which is very hard for humans to ascertain what what can access what and let's walk through like how does that actually get built like right so so if I, I think in front of us we're looking at this a request comes through can you walk yeah. us through and this is in amazon web services explicitly so we just pick yes. one cloud service provider to, to use as an example but walk yes. us through a little bit of like how complicated is this just on one instance right on one mm -hmm. on sort of one scenario this is a sort of logic that occurs when trying yeah. to find an yeah exactly so in, in in the any any request that's you know any action that's being uh as taking place from a person or a machine um on a, on a resource in aws uh, is going to go through this you know what is it seven stage process here and it, everything starts with the deny so by default nobody nobody nothing can do anything which is great um and you know it, it, the, the problem being is that there's this is like kind of like layers of onion or um, understanding um, what can actually be done has to go through these these processes. So you got SCPs, service control policies, are uh, policies that you can define at the account level or organization level uh, restrictions of what can be done in an account. So that request for um, James to access an S3 bucket is going to get evaluated against an SCP. Um, then it's going to, if let's say it passes the SCP, if the SCP does exist, because SCPs aren't always required, it's going to go through the resource-based policy. And the resource-based policy also has to allow James access um, to uh, that particular uh, the resource, um, uh, and uh, or it doesn't have to, or it doesn't, it can't explicitly deny the, my access to the resource. So for the permissions boundary, um, if we're using permissions boundary, which would be attached to my identity, um, that that um, my access to that uh, the S3 bucket could not conflict with the permissions policy. Set uh, permissions boundary boundary session policies. Are something that's even it's not even um, it's not even a tangible resource in, inside of AWS. It's something that's injected in into the session um, th through 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 another set of tooling. Um, and now that adds yet another um, layer of complication of um, in, in a dynamic way what I can what can I can access um, or what a, a machine can access. And the identity policy, which is the the policies of that is attached to, to my my person or, or my resource, is is the policies that saying what actions can I take uh, against um, other resources. Um, so once it's gone through that evaluation, and and this is sometimes it's a um, it's kind of like a yes you've passed this move on to the next one, and sometimes it's in an intersection of, of both. And it makes it really uh, a really hard problem. And after you get to that, that it, you answer the question. You know, is this can James do this thing or not? So, and, 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 yeah, and the, and we call that effective access, right? That's I mean, right. Essentially, yeah. yeah. So, so the world calls this that that intersection of all those things effective access. And I, I think you know, you call I, I heard you call this before the Amazon Web Services Identity Access Management Inferno, in yes. the sense that trying to understand what effective access is across a portfolio of thousands, if not tens of thousands of identities and possibly millions of resources becomes an almost impossible task right right yeah talk, yeah, talk yeah. That a little bit yeah so you know as if i wanted to go in today right now if i wanted to go and um or my let's say my my boss my cso asks 
um, I, I, I need to understand, you know, what kind of uh, access that, you know, this this user James, who you know, we're a little bit suspicious about his access. I want to know what he has access to today. There's no way to answer that question today with the tooling that that exists, and it's primarily be, because of uh, what we're calling the inferno here. This this uh, th those those that five or seven stage process we talked about in the previous slide. All these different kinds of ways to to d describe how a person or a thing has access to a thing. We can't. You can't do that. You 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 can't go into a tool as as it is today and and answer that question um, because like there's a lot of computation that's happening. You know, connecting the identities to the resources and then evaluating all, evaluating all those policies is a very tricky problem to solve. And also, you know, you have to also have to think about inside of these policies, which again are kind of machine languages, right? They're written in. Yeah. in and data structures, which is not really for humans to look at. You're yeah. throwing in things like programming structures, like conditionals and wildcards. It makes it even harder for, um, for yeah. humans to really understand. Yeah, and, and by the way, you have to do that every single time, right? So right. you have to manually inspect that today. If you were able to do that, this is a constantly shifting landscape across millions of comp sort of permutations. It, yeah. know, by the time you got that answer, you might be an old, old person. <laughs> right, absolutely. So, so I think you just talked, this answer to some extent, but like yep. this is really hard, right? So for people who yep. are sitting out there listening to the webinar, I think the answer is if you've struggled with identity access management governance, you're not alone because as we've talked about, you know, you'll see here in the bottom left, this is that same sort of workflow we did before that was fairly summarized, same thing here, which is, you know, there's an incredibly complicated workflow that needs to happen in order to, to essentially provide access and, understanding what that effective access is it you know ends up being really hard right and i think part of this is also about what you've talked about with, with in the past has been sort of true access i think as well um you know which i think talks about additional data if, if i recall um but um and, and to talk a little bit like what's the contextual business information that's important as part of this process perhaps yeah, so I think one of the, one of the problems here is um, I guess you're you you're not you're not seeing when you're when you're looking at purely at an AWS console or you know any of the, any of the cloud sort of uh, consoles, you only see data that's represented as, as it is as it pertains to the cloud. Like there there's no additional color or context around that data, so you you can't make the connections between a resource maybe and an application that's associated re with that resource or a resource. And um, it, it's uh, sort of data classification. Maybe it's a, you know, it's it's a kind of a HIPAA data kind of data you might find in a in a configuration management database. So that, that those those kinds of yeah. those kinds of data is, is really not available. Um, you know, so like uh, yeah. yet another layer of difficulty, right? Because not only right. you trying to piece all this together, but then when you do piece it together, you're not really sure. You can't contextually just quickly be like, oh that's the right level of access because it's married with this other information that provides context. Correct, yeah, that's right. Well, let's talk about the goals and outcomes of governance. Because so we just talked about how, why this is so problematic, right? So for 10 minutes, this is a big problem and people shouldn't feel like they're, they're on, their, uh, on their own when they run into this and they it's a problem. Let's just mm -hmm. talk about a little bit about what governance actually tries to, to get at. Like what, what should you be trying to accomplish with identity access management governance? And for me, it comes down to a, a few things. First, you really want to be able to gain visibility into this. So we just talked about, James, you just said, it's really hard to understand this stuff, but without that understanding, without that visibility, how do you actually assess, prioritize, and then remediate improper permission combinations? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think, what you were getting at, which is what ends up happening in the cloud too often, and why we see a lot of security and data breaches, is that you end up having developers or engineers or even security professionals who unintentionally right. grant permissions that are that are overly permissive right that, yeah. that create access and so if you go back and look at the capital one breach for example now that was a, a pretty there was a pretty long exploit exploitation chain right it wasn't a single sure. thing but sort of buried in the middle and what allowed for all this to happen was was unintended permission yeah. and I mean, it, you know, it, that, it, if you think about it i mean it, the the way that the the system the i am system is designed it's it's very open-ended and allows a lot of flexibility flexibility but you know with you know what's the saying when there's when you have something about power and freedom and 
don't don't make things don't don't screw things up so they're they're, they're giving this tool so much so much power um and capability well, it's, yet they it's haven't like spider-man right with, with, with great yeah. with great power comes great responsibility there, thank you that's the spider-man quote i was looking for yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah so, so yeah, yeah so there's so complex yet there's not a lot of not a lot of guardrails of governance on uh of, of enforcing of you know what is right and what well, the impact of all the things that you can do and i think that's where it comes down to which is this yeah. is why it's new perimeter which is that fundamentally right. if you are not careful about this generally people look engineers and developers just don't know what good looks like and so by default often they say well i'm just going to open up permissions because i'm just building this application i want this application to talk to things it's actually quite difficult for me to understand as we just talked about what effectively i should be providing how to actually even tune that because there's all these layers and as a result i'm just going to, to open it in a way that allows my application to work but maybe actually gives more access than it needs and that someday that becomes a problem that a an attacker or uh either an insider or outsider suddenly is aware of and takes advantage of um, right. and so fundamentally as you think about your sort of goals and outcomes, right? Well, goals should be how do I how do I effectively start to explore access, effective access by different lenses, principle versus resource versus application. I want to talk about that in a moment. Um, yeah. Understanding that true access, right? So I think what you were talking about there, with true access again, is how do you marry effective access with contextual information so you can mm -hmm. really start to make decisions about effective access based on the context. Mm -hmm. But then most importantly, it's it's really about establishing and maintaining least privilege. And that goes back to what we just talked about, which is you want to ensure that your organization is armed with the ability to understand what effective access is needed for mm -hmm. one thing to do its job, right? Whether that's a person or whether that's a, um, a resource or, or a system, right? It's just what is the minimum amount that is needed at this moment for um, for this application to function. Um, and then last but not least, it's if a security incident does occur or if we suspect that one is one occurred, well, I need to be able to go back and understand what my blast radius was relative to cloud identity access management, right? And it may talk briefly about that, James. Like what, yeah. what does blast I mean, radius look like in this world? Sure. I, and I think it links re really well back to the uh, least privilege, right? So you know, in the hypothetical situation that um, let's say an EC2 instance, uh, had a role attached to it, and that role had could could access all of the S3 buckets in, in your application or in your, your cloud environment rather. Um, if that EC2 instance was compromised and someone got shell access on the machine, then they they could access all of your S3 buckets. But um, but by knowing the blast radius of that EC2 instance, if you were doing this, some sort of exploration and understanding um, the role attached to that EC2 instance, it could, you could see that it could, they could reach every S3 bucket that would raise some some red flags and and and, yeah. and hopefully you're going to tell your security team let's reduce the scope of that role so it only yeah. needs to access the things that it needs to access and by doing that you're, you're reducing the blast radius that's right and, and in the case of, of an incident possibly occurring on an ec2 instance you at least also then can say oh well now we have to understand our scope of concern needs to expand to all these s3 buckets that's right? right i mean that's both, both ways otherwise you might say oh well the ec2 instance has been popped but whatever right nothing was important on there oh, I forgot that, that that person might have had the ability to exploit all these things that held confidential, sensitive information. Exactly. Um, so, Tommy, because you've spent a bunch of time on this problem over the yeah. last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about how you, what are the sort of, how are you thinking about the data? Walk us through that a little bit and the sure. questions that you think everyone should be asking of that data. Do you mind doing that for a moment? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we have a, um, a a couple things on the on the left, right hand side. We have what's you know we'll say this is contained in the on the Divi Cloud side, and on the left hand side we have a customer resource. So um, we have um, in the core Divi Cloud application we are already harvesting information about all of the resources and and the policies um, um, and, and the principles. So we, we already kind of contain that information. However, we are doing a secondary. Um, analysis of that within the IM product that we're talking about today, and we're calling that the policy analyzer. And that's the thing that, that's really doing the, the the hard work of mapping the resources um, to the principles, um, and 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 putting that into into the the Divi Cloud application. Um, and that's uh, also is uh, we're, is adding we're also adding additional contextual information 
um, from from two parts, and that, that's that's come from really from the customer from the customer or or, or the or the user's uh, resources. Um, what we're doing is taking data from the a customer's uh, enterprise authentication system, something like Active Directory, for example, so we can tie the federated user um, to um, a a role. And in most enterprises, they're doing some sort some um, sort of um, role assumption or federation. Um, so um, and normally in 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 the AWS world, um, I, if I'm looking at access for James. Um, and I'm a federated user from the AWS console side. I'm only going to be able to look at a role, and that role may say, um, you know, Foo administrator. And I have no idea from the AWS side who is uh, part of the Foo administrator. So what we're trying to do by by providing and, and, and ingesting that Active Directory or enterprise authentication information is we're making that link to, all the way back to the user to to the to the identity that that user is assuming in in um, in the cloud, um, and then from from the from adding contextual information around the business around um, what what is what are what are my applications and who are the managers uh, that support these applications and what business unit do those applications roll up to are these my crown jewel applications um, what kind of data classifications do these uh, applications require um, that's where we're to inject, we have the capability of adjusting from CMDBs like ServiceNow. Um, that that kind of metadata about your applications, and we can then put all of that together and enrich um, um, the IAM data that we're presenting in the Explorer. Yeah. So to summarize, I mean, you, you, yeah. you know, the way you've thought about this problem is there's these gaps, right? And and you need to you, know, you need to bring all this data together into a single data model that makes it easier to both understand um, the data, but also to make that data contextual. Um, That's right. Yep. Yeah. And then yeah. and then. There's just not enough value. There's just not enough value um, um, in an AWS native tool um, yeah. to understand the business level information. Yeah, and then that starts to that starts to add these four questions you've outlined on the right here. Of sort of these are the yeah. questions that you think everyone should be asking of this data. You know, and it's the data that we're pulling together as part of our product. But more importantly, this is just writ large. People should yeah. be asking these questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so talk to me a little bit, you know, as you thought through this problem, one of the things you, you realized in talking with a lot of folks was that you really needed to be able to view the data through three different lenses to, yep. to explore it. Talk, talk a little bit how, you know, why did why is that important? Why is it important to be able to sort of view this through the, the lenses of applications, resources, and principles? Sure. So we all know that, you know, you know principles uh, uh, and resource, uh, sorry, the understanding I am for principles and resources is uh, pretty pretty easy. So, you know, what can um what can james access or what can the ec the ec2 instance access but when we're asking um um when we're asking or alternately we also ask like who can access this resource so those are pretty two easy to understand concepts but again that looking at resources and principles is it just there's a lot of information there and it's not really grouped in a way that most people um um may under, may, may want to browse the access or really understand their environment. So we come up with this notion of, of applications, which is kind of a logical grouping of um, resources um, in, in, um, in, your, in your cloud that represent uh, a particular application. So any application could have EC2 instances and S3 buckets and RDS and, and what have you. Um, but to understand who has access to an application and uh, what resources are composed? What uh, what resources are are making are, are building are making are made up of? Sorry, <laughs> it, for a given applications, which resources are inside of that application? Yeah. Um, it is it is not something that's you know provided out out of the bat. And well, now and I, think, yeah. I think again what you, what you found is that most people said it, that's the that's the crux of it, right? Is that it's not right. the problem isn't you know, like yes, I have a hard time understanding the principal resource relationships per se, yeah. as we've talked about, it's very hard. But yeah. actually, there's a whole other level of difficulty, which is, that's not the view I actually need. I need to know right. who has, yeah. you know, what is what is going on with this application, and that requires a whole other logical layering of sort of constructs on top of this that, that isn't available out, out of the, in, in the cloud service provider itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, cloud service providers, you know, they, they can't tell you, that not only can't they tell you, you know, who has access or what has access to a, to a, a given resource, I mean, by default, then they they also can't tell you who who can do what inside of an application, and 
in most most places you know they're really like the, the management and 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 security folks are you know really want to be able to to browse and break down their their resources and understand the access between um, um, humans to applications and resources to applications. So let's talk about what what functionally right the, the goal of, of everything is 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 to some extent this right which is you want to govern identity access management in a way that allows you to shrink and, and we call it observed behavior here although I guess it should be sort of you know expected or allowed behavior to some extent right but but you want the the thing whatever it is to have the limited access that it needs and what we find when we start inspecting cl cloud environments of you know our, our customers and even ours right is that the big sort of uh, purple circle is what effective access is today right that if we looked at a something the inner the relationship between two things the effective access is the purple but mm -hmm. as we peer into it the the hot pink is what actually should be happening and is actually probably what is being used right and, and so you have this enormous opportunity to, to, to reduce risk um yeah. right and that and that and what we mean by that is a if you're able to shrink that purple circle to match the hot pink circle what mm -hmm. you've done is achieved least privilege yeah. and if you think about what that's helping you it's reduced your attack surface enormously I mean, right yeah, now, you think about the, the yeah. pink, the pink circle being what you really need to protect, but what you're really doing is protecting the purple circle. Well, that's problematic. And then yeah. two, if something did happen, well, your pink circle is much smaller, and so your blast radius is much smaller. And that's and, right. and so how, you know, and what does this look like when, when you think about remediation of this? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's again the complication of having to sort of sort through what. When you pull something away, what it reduces, right? How, talk, talk about for one moment there, just what that looks like. Yeah, so I mean, the 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 way that we've thought about it is, you know, let let's let's kind of make that a bit of a simulation. So when we're when we're looking at effective access uh, between a principal um, and a resource, um, and let's say you're trying to go down this path to reduce your your footprint. Um, you can actually play with the, all the policies and um, that are associated with that relationship between the the, the principal and the, and the resource. So you can you can toggle these things to see how they are, how they are playing on each other, how they're influencing. Yeah. By that kind of de uh, detective work, you can really kind of um, very quickly come come to see why what's what's giving this, these these uh, permissions that that I don't want. Well, I think you hit on an important point there, which is even when you get to the point where you're trying to start to remove permissions. It requires mm -hmm. you don't it's not necessarily clear what permissions are, are giving the level of access because it's so complicated and you've really got right. to sort of find ways to experiment with that and so you know even just reducing this and doing this all at scale is incredibly complicated mm -hmm. and that's that's where divi cloud comes in so just you know we've, we've talked a lot about the challenges we've talked about a lot the, the goals um james has talked a bit about the product that we're building but divi cloud today exists as a um, cloud security posture manager product that helps customers uh, protect cloud and container environments from misconfigurations, policy violations, threats, and importantly, as we talked about today, identity and access management challenges. And we do that across Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and Alibaba Cloud, and Kubernetes, which we see as another infrastructure layer. And we do that really across IaaS, PaaS, functions of service, containers of service, and then again, the, the broader environment around identity access management. And to some extent, we've always uh, provided IM around policy protection, which is things like MFA and, and other elements. But increasingly, we've been building products around um, how do we help you establish uh, least, least privileged access and reduce that cloud blast radius. And exciting to know that, that James, I think you'll be launching in the coming months the uh, I am governance tool that you just we've talked about here to help solve some of these very complicated products uh, problems that we've, we've described and, and reach the goals we described. Um, if you want to learn more information about uh, cloud identity access management and cloud security in general, we have a number of helpful resources available at divicloud.com slash cloud dash IAM. I -A -M. Uh, and also, uh, if you're interested in kicking the tires in DiviCloud and seeing how we can help you achieve continuous security and compliance, you can do so with a free 30 day trial. Uh, from divicloud.com slash free trial. Again, that's divicloud.com slash free dash trial. Uh, thanks, James, for 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 being on uh, on this webinar with me today. It's been lovely. 
uh, yeah, hopefully we've given some folks here the uh, sort of a, a quick view of why cloud is I didn't access manager so challenging and some of the ways they should be framing how to help solve this problem. Um, and in the coming months, we're really excited to help roll out our, our latest uh, module to help solve these problems in, in an automated way as well. Uh, James, any last uh, words here before we uh, say? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. It's been great uh, chatting and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to all, all sorts of questions and, and, and feedback that we'll hopefully get on this product and you know, looking looking forward to launching here in a few months. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody.